Chapman, but I wanted to take a couple of minutes to introduce Dr. Javier Garcia, who's been a tremendous colleague over the years. I had the pleasure. I remember when I first came in September of 2016, this fall is going to be five years, and I had uh, dinner with him. And then over the years, I had an opportunity to interact with him and and have a chance to just not hear about his philosophy, but the work that he is uh, doing, you know, here in the region. But most important, uh, the, the thinking that he has a process uh, through which he's gone to uh, be able to think about diseases that affect the neurological system. You can see he uh, did his bachelor's at Duke, then uh, did a, his MD in Tulane. He did his internship at Emory, and then he went and spent some time at Harvard, came back to Emory for his residency, and then uh, became an attending neurosurgeon, uh, an assistant professor at Emory, and then eventually came in by 1993 into uh, becoming a partner at the Lyerly Neurosurgery Group. And he's been a tremendous friend to many, many of us as a mentor and uh, really, really involved in a lot of uh, stuff in organizing our surgery and education and research as well. Uh, lots of honors, lots of recognition, of course, and we are very, very, very excited. At a personal level, of course, it's just a pleasure to always interact with Javier and be able for us to build bridges to learn what is going on in our community as well and how all the departments are making us better. I love, I always tell when I came, I was so excited to see a wonderful, wonderful program, a very, very powerful program at Baptist, a very powerful program at um, St. Vincent's because I always felt that the better the programs, the better we all become because we help each other elevate the quality of care that we provide in our community. So I'm going to stop sharing this right here, Javier, and see if you can actually share your screen and see if we can go from there. And I saw also the CME uh, code for everybody. You can see it right there. Take it away, Javier. Thank you very much, Q. I really appreciate it that uh, the opportunity to be here with all of you and my good friends, uh, Gordon Dean and uh, Eric Notmeyer and others. So this is a real uh, honor and a pleasure to be with you. And uh, uh, I originally had a very lofty uh, kind of title for this talk uh, uh, when I thought I had an hour or 90 minutes to give it. Uh, then Q informed me last week that he was only giving me 30 minutes. So uh, I had to streamline things a bit. And I wanna give you uh, sort of my insider's view uh, 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 within the industry of uh, minimally invasive uh, spinal surgery. I was on the Alpha uh, launch team uh, some 25 years ago for the metrics tube. And over that time period, I've done probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,000, give or take a few hundred uh, minimally invasive uh, surgery cases for discectomies, uh, decompressions, uh, deformity corrections, reconstructions, uh, tumors, and uh, trauma. Uh, I also had the opportunity, it was given that uh, the infancy of the industry at the time uh, to design the first uh, minimally invasive uh, uh, posterior lumbar inner body implant, as well as uh, two of the first uh, three percutaneous pedicle screw systems. Our group uh, focuses on minimally invasive spinal surgery. We probably do some 750 or so uh, cases a year. And uh, I'm told that we are by volume have done more robotic surgery uh, than any uh, group in the country. So we're, uh, hopefully I can speak uh, from a, a position of experience. So you see at the bottom, my uh, uh, disclosures, uh, nothing unusual there. Um, for those of you who know me and thought I was gonna come here and regale you with all the marvels and wonders of minimally invasive, uh, that's not necessarily a case. I won't do uh, as Mark Anthony did in Shakespeare's Caesar uh, to bury MIS, uh, but I'm not necessarily here to praise it. And if I had to rename this talk, I, I would like it to be more uh, MIS, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So why MIS? Well, there are three things that the patient sees. Uh, the x-rays, the bill, and the incision. Of course, the x-rays mean very little to the patient. The bill is handled by a third-party payer. So uh, the patient really focuses uh, on the incision. And so there's this element introduced uh, of uh, perception as reality. What they see uh, uh, reflects the quality of, of the work uh, done under the incision. So with that in mind, take a look at these five cases. Um, uh, they all look different here, but they are the same procedure done uh, minimally invasively by five recognized uh, 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 minimally invasive surgeons. So this is an L45 or an L5S1 T lift, and they look completely different. Um, which, uh, and if you had to choose just simply based on how it looked, you'd probably choose the uh, one in the bottom right-hand corner where you have the two small incisions. 
But this begs the question, what is MIS? And the fact that these five cases uh, reflect that there are no uh, universal standards in the training of MIS uh, and in the performance of MIS surgery. In fact, if you uh, uh, look across the device industry and the surgeons and the patients, uh, I think each has a different understanding of what minimally invasive surgery is. For the industry, it's the sales of percutaneous pedicle screw systems. For surgeons, it's using dilators to put in either tubular retractors or uh, split tubes or, or, or modular retractors. Um, for the academic uh, spine surgeons, I, they, they will define MIS as a suite of technology dependent techniques and uh, procedures that reduce local operative tissue damage, systemic surgical stress, enabling early return to function, striving for better outcomes and traditional techniques. Well, this, this doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, these, this tortured definition. And of course, no one would ever uh, tell the, explain this to a patient. And in fact, the patients have a totally different view of MIS. For them, this is Band-Aid surgery. If you were to take the Band-Aid off, this is what you see. And so um, uh, this is a beautiful uh, cosmetic result. And you're only going to get this by using a tube. And so if I had to define MIS surgery, minimally invasive surgery, uh, minimally invasive surgery is tube surgery. And here you see uh, uh, an example of the uh, clean operative field. So let's start with the good. Well, uh, uh, there are several publications that uh, show that MIS results in shorter hospitalizations, less use of narcotics, a faster recovery, uh, much lower infection rate. And because you're preserving the natural stabilizers in the spine, the muscle attachments to the, to the uh, bone, the innervation and the blood supply, uh, it's presumed to be better long-term function. But in my experience, the, 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 the uh, substantial change that MIS has brought is this sense of wellness to spinal surgery. Uh, some of the older ones in, in, the, in the audience can remember that when a patient used to come to a doctor for, for a fusion or a decompression, even with a good outcome, there was a sense that they were damaged. And that has completely changed. It has done uh, to spine surgery, MIS, what, what uh, sports medicine did to orthopedics, was, which was introduce this sense of wellness. And patients now come, they already know they need a back operation, but they want to be able to, to do that triathlon next year, go back to playing golf and a very active lifestyle. And of course, this is what it would look like in the simplest form. You find the midline, you make a small incision, you put the dilators in. In the old days, we used an endoscope. We probably did the first two or 250 cases with an endoscope, and now we use a high-powered microscope. And this is effectively the essence of MIS, if you will, is that uh, uh, through a small incision, you will split the muscle. And here we're taking the tube out after doing a decompression, and you can see the, the atraumatic uh, uh, exit here of this tube as the muscles come together uh, through a fascia that wasn't even cut uh, through this uh, very small and cosmetically appealing incision. And here's someone who had an open uh, uh, decompression done at one level. They either had a recurrence or, or a disc herniation at a new level, and they uh, had an MIS procedure done through the same incision, much smaller. I have the royal thumb. My thumbnail is 20 millimeters, so you can see this incision is somewhere uh, in the 15 or 16 millimeter uh, uh, area. So here's a simple disc uh, surgery done. Um, we do decompressions. Uh, we can do a bilateral decompression through a unilateral approach. This is Medtronic's method. Uh, we have our own method. We do a little differently than Medtronic. I'm not going to tell you how that is so that uh, uh, Dr. Chen or Dr. Fox don't start stealing patients from me. But um, you're able to do three levels from one incision, uh, as you see here. And uh, uh, this would be the result. And three levels would be done through the incision on the right uh, vertically so that you can move up and down. And if you were doing one or two levels, you might do it uh, on the left where there's a bit more uh, cosmetic uh, uh, for the patient. Um, uh, we can access the contralateral foramen uh, and subarticular disc herniations um, by putting the tube in on the opposite side and repositioning in it, and then using the ligamentum flavum to protect the dura and do a ventral laminotomy and access the, the, the foramen really very well. And of course, these are done as outpatient, but you can get to subarticular disc herniations and foraminal stenosis in this manner. I go to meetings and I see this, the, the experts, if you will, talk about far lateral disc herniations and they'll show an incision that's maybe three or four centimeters off the midline. Well, this, this puts you right uh, over the facet and, and, and you're going to have to uh, deal with the facet, the, the facet in some manner. We come out on these far lateral extraforaminal disc herniations at seven, eight, and nine centimeters. Uh, and this gives us uh, clear access to the foramen and uh, preserves the facet uh, in its entirety. 
And this is what it, it would look like a, on the far left, a transverse incision. You see in the middle picture, uh, the incision is actually over to the right. And uh, sometimes we do the blue plate special. We'll drop the tube in multiple locations uh, to uh, sort of address all the pathology that uh, seems to be ailing the patient. Here's a, a notorious uh, medical malpractice attorney who had a stable grade two spondylolisthesis and severe foraminal stenosis. You can see here uh, uh, on the left side, he had lateral recess stenosis as well. We'd put a tube off the midline, did a lateral recess decompression. And then we put a tube seven centimeters off the midline and came in outside the foramen and drilled off the inferior third of his pedicle. We left enough pedicle there in case we had to come back and do a fusion to be able to put a screw in. And if you see here, his pre-op uh, CT on the far left, on the far right is the pre-op MRI. And then in the middle, you see the nerve root there uh, uh, totally decompressed uh, for his stable uh, uh, spondylolisthesis radiculopathy. Uh, you're able to do cervical uh, uh, minimally invasive surgery, much more limited really to lateral recess stenosis, foraminal stenosis, and uh, disc herniations, and a little bit of a different animal than the uh, lumbar spine. We're able to do far lateral thoracic uh, disc herniations. You don't see too many of these, and uh, there are actually some tricks in terms of getting the tube in between the rib and the, the head of the transverse process. Sometimes you have to drill down the uh, the uh, anterior uh, half or two thirds of the tran transverse process to get to the pedicle. But uh, these are cases not too difficult to do. And we even do uh, thoracic inner body fusions uh, here, a, a T-TIF, if you will, um, with two peak implants on the left. <clears throat> um, we'll reduce spondylolisthesis uh, here in a mini open, what we would call mini open and x lift. Despite what the rep will tell you, you're not going to get a complete reduction just by putting the implant in, and you can do a reduction uh, with the uh, instrumentation. Unfortunately, you don't get the rotation of the vertebra uh, that you need to restore the proper lordosis here, and that's done typically through 20 millimeter incisions. You can do more complex cases here. Um, uh, in a similar fashion, again, using uh, bilateral metrics tubes on either side uh, coming in. And uh, uh, you can see it improve the posture a little bit of the patient. And again, these are done through uh, small incisions. We'll do sometimes a combination of open, mini open, and MIS for procedures for deformity correction. In this case, uh, this was a former collegiate cha uh, NCAA champion rower at Penn uh, who had had a auto fusion L3-4 in this deformity in the coronal plane. Uh, mostly, we started out with an A-lift at L4-5 and L5-S1, as you see in this picture here, uh, to establish a good base for the fusion. Then we did an X-lift at L2-3 uh, and L1-2 on the left side. We went, flipped the patient over, did the right side, T12-L1. Then we gave him a couple of days off, brought him back to the operating room two days later, did uh, osteotomies posteriorly, and put the instrumentation in, and the patient went home the next day and, and had a good result. In this patient, she had had a lumbar fusion at L4-5 and L5-S1 done open, as you can see here in the middle picture, um, and we ended up doing uh, uh, exolith ACRs, uh, posterior osteotomies, and then a deformity correction. And these patients would typically stay two nights. Um, the workhorse uh, really for us has been uh, the T-LIF. In this case, you see at L4-5, and we typically put uh, two or three implants in. And it always struck me as unusual to do this exposure uh, like you see here on the left and in the middle um, uh, uh, for an inner body fusion when you really you're only working in this the one, center, one inch circle. Uh, so it, 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 it really is unnecessary. It's more of a mindset, a mental thing uh, to be able to work down this tube and not have all this uh, open uh, exposed uh, spine. And so we kind of created an algorithm of how we would do minimally invasive surgery and establish zones, if you will, for decompressions versus inner body fusions versus uh, far lateral procedures. And we would typically uh, use uh, two tubes, one on each side. Uh, 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 and, and this is, of course, in the pre-robotic era. And we use the particular anatomy to, to really uh, 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 judge or determine how we come in at each level. The L5-S1 uh, area, the pedicles are more uh, obliquely oriented. As you go up the spine, they become more parasagially oriented. And of course, we exploit the lumbar lordosis uh, where all the pedicles uh, uh, radiate back to uh, a, a single point or a small area in the lumbar spine for our incision planning. And, and these days, really, 
uh, all our inner body fusions for the most part above L5 are done uh, through uh, lateral approaches. So really uh, T-LIF has been uh, uh, mostly at L5 S1, which actually is perfectly suited because as it turns out, Kamen's triangle sits uh, uh, precisely under the superior articular process of S1 and it is bounded on either side by the exiting route and the traversing route. So you can remove the superior articular process um, and uh, uh, not expose those two nerve roots and have plenty of room to work. And when, after you put your dilators in and take them out um, and put your tube in, this is what you should see, the multifidus muscle above, and you should see this fat pad, which delineates the, the, the fascial plane between the multifidus muscle and the longissimus muscle. You remove the soft tissue, identify the facet, and just follow the facet down, as you see here, to the ligamentum flavum, remove the ligamentum flavum, coagulate the epidural veins, and without even seeing or exposing the traversing route here or the uh, exiting route uh, here, you see you have plenty of room to work at least a centimeter. So you do your discectomy. And we really focus on the discectomy. Uh, it's a critical part of the operation. We try to take all the nucleus out. As the nucleus degenerates, it becomes more acidic and that acidic environment uh, in inhibits fusion. And, and I was always so proud, I would brag that I probably did a better nucleectomy than anyone. And then I started putting an endoscope into the disc space. And uh, uh, I was really humbled by what I saw. Uh, I left a lot of disc material and, uh, and this isn't bad. I'd give myself a B or a B minus on this, but there's some cartilaginous in play. You, see, you still see some disc remnants. So uh, uh, put an endoscope down one day and grade yourself and you'll be, you'll be uh, surprised and somewhat disappointed. One thing we do or used to do, it's, it's a long run for a short slide, was we would uh, set the metrics tube over the posterior superior iliac spine and uh, uh, make a small osteotomy into the iliac crest and remove uh, uh, 10, 15 cc's of autograft and then get another 10 cc's or so in the uh, Lucan's trap or the bone trap. And these patients would come back to the clinic at six weeks for a follow-up appointment clinically doing much better than when we use allograft and bone substitutes. They were already incorporating and were eager to get on with their physical therapy. So then we put the autograph into the disc space above. We put one implant in. We actually had designed uh, tools to be able to move the first implant over and put a second implant in and even put a third implant in. Uh, and once we're uh, done with the inner body work here, we uh, take a small piece of fat from below scarpus fascia uh, over the ilium and uh, usually through the same incision, fill the dead space uh, in the foramen and Kamen's triangle and then reconstitute the facet with the remaining autograft. And some 20 years ago, I was approached by Spinal Concepts to, to, to start their, their now Zimmer to uh, build their inner body program. And I told them whatever we design, we're gonna be able to put down a tube one day. So it has to be bulleted. And they, no, 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 and the surgeons don't want that. They just want a rectangular block to put in. So we ended up uh, kind of developing over the years a, an allograft you see here with kind of a rounded tip. And then we developed cadence. And then finally artists on the far right, a bulleted implant where the load bearing surfaces are posteriorly and laterally, and that the anterior, the tip is purely for uh, uh, distracting the inner space. And as I said, we'll, uh, at L5S1, we were obsessive at some point about putting three implants in and you can see the footprint, it's like an A-lift. Uh, uh, effectively. And of course, more recently, we've gone to uh, uh, expanding implants in the axial plane. <clears throat> and one thing we've, we've uh, been, we've used a lot and been somewhat disappointed in some ways is the, uh, because of the lack of, uh, of uh, versatility, but use of the robot. Of course, the robot for the most part puts in pedicle screws. We actually use it to guide our trajectories uh, uh, for our T-lifts at L5S1, as you see here in the middle. And uh, we exploit um, uh, the lumbar lordosis to plan, pre-plan our screws so that the towers will come out at the same point in the skin and will be symmetric. Again, perception and versus reality, what the patient sees. And uh, uh, we we've, we've found that very uh, easy to do and helpful. And uh, we find also that the robot allows us in the longer constructs to line the head of the screws up uh, for easier rod passage. And that includes putting iliac screws in line without offset connectors um, uh, uh, on the longer constructs. Um, we do not feel navigation is an MIS tool. Uh, it is more of a mini open tool. For na to navigate, you really need space to be able to move the, the navigated instrument. Um, in, in going percutaneously, if you need to move uh, over several millimeters or a centimeter, you're going to have to pull the tool out and 
and pierce the skin again or pierce the muscle again. So we've, we've not uh, uh, employed, particularly in the era of robotics, uh, uh, much navigation. And we use the exoscope for a while. It really doesn't add much uh, to, the, uh, to the minimally invasive. So what's the bad? Well, <clears throat> the same complications you have open, you have minimally invasively. One thing that we struggled with for a while was epidural hematoma. Uh, we found that our incidence probably doubled uh, from very small 1% maybe open uh, to two or 3% minimally invasively. And we found that probably putting drains in was creating a vacuum effect and opening up uh, veins that may have been compressed by the retractor that weren't bleeding as we remove the retractor or uh, drawing blood from the uh, uh, from uh, 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 insufficiently waxed uh, uh, bone uh, cancellous bone surfaces. Uh, we also know because of the, the, the reliance uh, on uh, x-ray and fluoro uh, increased radiation exposure and the robot has helped somewhat with that. And, uh, but uh, that has certainly uh, been one problem that we've tried to mitigate. Uh, tissue creep from the very beginning, the retractors, uh, the tubes have a certain conformity or geometry to them. The bone doesn't. So there's always going to be some tissue coming in because we do neuromonitoring and don't paralyze the patient when you, uh, since the, the bleeding, uh, the veins and arteries are near the nerve, the neurovascular bundle. Uh, when you coagulate, uh, the patient jumps, the muscle retracts, but then comes back in under the wall of the retractor and, uh, uh, and obstructs your vision. Um, uh, despite that, industry designed these uh, retractors uh, that cost seventy-five to one hundred thousand dollars. And the irony is, is that you take this uh, uh, split tube type retractor and you open it up because the muscle is attached at the bottom. When you open it up, it forces the retractor out and just puts more tissue between you and the bony anatomy. And and so you end up having to to cut out uh, this uh, huge divot from someone's spine. And to me, that's not very minimally invasive. So when you put the dilators in, put the tube in, take the dilators out. On the far left, this is what you see. You don't see uh, what is in the Medtronic brochure, which is the nice clean lamina and the ligamentum flavum under it. You have to remove soft tissue. And again, uh, to preserve the facet and also because of tissue creep, you don't, you don't expose the entire 14 millimeter diameter here. Um, about 20 years ago with Robert Simonson, I developed these uh, beveled tubes uh, with him. And we show these to surgeons and they'd say, this, that's brilliant, that's perfect. It'll fit right on the lamina, totally eliminate creep. Well, the reality is it was not the case at all. In fact, the beveled portion sat on the hypertrophic facet and put more distance between you and the lamina and increase the tissue creep. And so this was a dud. Um, to remove that soft tissue, you have to use your suction to kind of create some uh, tension on the tissue and then you cut with the bovi and there's, you develop this smoke and it's difficult to see. In a smaller tube, it's harder for your assistant to put suction in. And the same thing happens on the right here with the drill, which you'll be holding with two hands. Difficult for the, the uh, assistant to help you. The bipolars in the smaller tubes are bow-legged and obstruct your vision. Um, if you use a metrics bipolar where the tines are parallel and together, when you squeeze them, the tips actually open. It's more difficult to coagulate and certainly difficult to remove a cottonoid, for example. I told you about multiple implants. Well, unfortunately, the downside is that they don't, they're not lordotic and you don't get sufficient lordosis uh, correction uh, with a single level uh, uh, procedure. You can use this expandable implant at, at one level and not get the lordosis. If you do a multi-level x lift here, you can uh, compensate for the lack of lordosis. You, you're not getting at L5S1. You can get using the 10 and 15 degree implants at the other levels. And of course, industry designs there says, well, just compress across the construct. <clears throat> and of course, all their, their, their uh, systems are designed for uh, saw bones or in cadavers. But if you're trying to use a small incision and give the patient that perception of true minimally invasive, you're going to find the towers cross and there's no way to attach a, uh, a, a, a mechanism to compress uh, sufficiently and get the lordosis uh, in these cases. And uh, here with Sextant, uh, they had one uh, system that worked fairly well, but still uh, when you would compress, the, the tulip heads would bind on the rod and you would get maybe a few millimeters of compression, but no lordosis and re recreation of the uh, uh, lordosis. While I, I, I years ago did endoscopic discectomy, haven't done any recently, I do see a role for endoscopic discectomy in, in certain uh, smaller disc herniations or sequestered fragments and certainly subarticular or extraforaminal disc herniations. I do not, I think, I do not see a role for endoscopic T-lift, uh, not without some improvement in the technology um, that's out there for disc preparation. Um, the, 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 it's hard to imagine getting a 12 millimeter implant down an eight 
a millimeter or 10 millimeter tube. It's going to have to be an expandable. And as you all know, expandable implants have very compromised insufficient graft volume inside of the cage itself. And of course, by the very nature of the endoscopic T-lift, you're going to have a very difficult time preparing any part of the disc space except for where the implant goes. And there's one uh, a very well-known MIS spine surgeon who's really pushing this procedure. And if you look at Jay here at the bottom, that's what he calls adequate uh, end plate preparation, which I would say is not the case at all. And if you go to the far right at the bottom here, you can see that his incision is uh, actually bigger than what we would use uh, doing a tubular uh, T-lift. So this is a question. It's one thing to say you can do something, and uh, it's another to, to recognize that it's not the best way of doing things. And so what, is the, what are the ugly? Well, uh, just like with open surgery, uh, but probably more so because uh, of the uh, insufficient disc preparation, uh, implants spit out. In this case, you had a banana implant that was placed originally in the right place, but because the, the, the inner space wasn't released, if you will, just like doing a total joint, uh, the implant, uh, like a watermelon seed, uh, uh, spit back out. Um, even using multiple implants, but certainly with a single implant, you have uh, the, the incidence of subsidence. And this is a, a predictor for uh, a clinical failure and for non-union. And in the case to the far right, you see even an expandable cage in the axial plane, uh, we violate the end plates, we expand the cage, and we get a fracture here. Um, so we're working in the softest part of the end plate rather than the uh, 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 near the apophyseal ring where the bone is uh, uh, harder and more inviting for a big implant. And these always frustrate me to see this very rigid construct at L3-4 and L4-5 sitting on top of this little single uh, uh, T-lift implant and just uh, S1 screws. Again, this is an invitation for a clinical disaster or a, clinic, a poor outcome. And I always think of the iconic Bacardi buildings uh, in Miami, uh, which look kind of strange uh, in that they're so top heavy. And so here I see this five level uh, X lift with the instrumentation from T11 to S1, no iliac fixation, all resting on these two little uh, T lift implants, which aren't even symmetric, which tells me that one of them probably is violating uh, uh, the end plate. And, you know, this is, uh, in my view, this is uh, never going to work. Um, one surgeon showed this at a national meeting. This is MIS. Imagine showing this to a patient and telling him that this is your MIS T lift and your MIS deformity surgeon. Hard to gather with that. And then now we have pain management physicians coming in and doing these uh, procedures um, um, under dubious indications, uh, interspinous spacers, and the mild procedure, which is not even done under direct visualization. It's done indirectly using fluoroscopy. So you have to question the efficacy of this. Most of you probably weren't born when they came out with someone who didn't know anything about spinal biomechanics came out with the trans one procedure, which is put in through an incision near the rectum. Imagine uh, putting a, a, an implant into the spine uh, uh, through that approach. And of course, this, pe this person didn't know anything about biomechanics. It was an interventional radiologist. And the only thing I like about this is the use of the facet screws. I do think that is a minimally invasive tool uh, that probably has a role uh, in the era of single position surgery and uh, uh, with robotics. So now I'm going to end with something that I would call the really good. And Eric Nomar <laughs> discusses, he and I have discussed this at some length, and I think he would say this is the really ugly. But uh, this is a, 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 an anterior column release or a three column release doing a T lift. We call it a T lift ACR. As I said, we're really doing T lift almost exclusively at L5S1. And after you've done a multi level X lift uh, or a big deformity correction, you've got this long, uh, stiff, uh, rigid construct sitting on L5-S1. And your choices are either to go anteriorly, which to some extent diminishes the entire minimally invasive nature or less invasive nature of your deformity correction, or go posteriorly, where you're really going to have to build, build a big implant and recapture the lordosis. 40% of the lordosis in lumbar spine comes at L5-S1. It's your greatest opportunity at one single level to, to uh, correct the patient's uh, 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 sagittal plane uh, deformity. And you should be shooting for a, a number 20 to 25 degrees of, of lordosis. And, and don't be deceived by supine imaging. When you put the patient prone, the vessels actually move away uh, from the spine, maybe three, four, five millimeters. And really all you have to do before surgery uh, is look at the preoperative MRIs at the retroperitoneal fat uh, area to see if uh, uh, the, 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 this patient is, is a candidate for this kind of procedure. And typically there's 35 to 40 millimeters of room in the front uh, here. 
um, uh, and with the caveat being that the left-sided uh, iliac uh, uh, vessels are going to be closer to the midline, maybe a centimeter or 15 millimeters away from the midline than on the right side. And of course, in the bottom right, this patient, you can see the common iliac vein is sitting right in the midline uh, on the anterior annual. So this is probably not somebody that you're going to want to um, do this on. And the conventional wisdom is that you put a lordotic implant in and you get lordosis, and that simply isn't the case. You need to do releases in the anterior column, the middle column, and the posterior column with osteotomies. And that's what we're doing here, putting tubes bilaterally, removing the facets, entering into Kamen's triangle, releasing the disc space, and then getting into the uh, anterior annulus. And this is the critical step. So we take a paddle distractor, we start small and end up going a little bigger, do a, 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 a enter the annulus uh, anteriorly, uh, move it over and do something uh, uh, going more obliquely and then something parasagitally. Then we'll do it on the other side. And in fact, we even designed these uh, uh, particular paddle distractors uh, that, that were more lordotic so that they wouldn't dig into the end plate as you see here in the top right. And we even put a little positive stop here, but you can mallet in and you can feel it give through the anterior annulus. And, uh, and you're doing this fairly slowly. And we've done probably 200 cases like this. We've not had any uh, uh, vascular uh, complications uh, uh, at all or that we're aware of. And, um, um, but so here's a case of a patient who gets a two level uh, T lift. This is the preoperative MRI. Uh, here's the preoperative CT scan. So I'm gonna go kind of back and forth here and let you see uh, the difference and, and focus on L5S1. So you can see here the, the uh, post and the pre and the post again. And we're going from 10 degrees of lordosis to 25 degrees of lordosis. Now the, the criticism here very clearly is that you're getting very poor end plate coverage because of the conformity or the shape of the implant. Um, and of course we've done several of these uh, in different cases under different circumstances. And we've gone now uh, uh, to a, uh, a expandable cage that gets up to 20 degrees of lordosis. And we'll typically, again, put two in because L5S1 is the, the base of the, of the construct. The spine works a little like a diving board. You go out to one end, you jump up and down, you get a lot of movement, but where the stresses are translated is where the board is attached to the side of the pool. And L5S1 is analogous to that. And so here's a patient who had had a, a four level uh, fusion, um, on the right, you see the preoperative uh, standing film and after the TLIF uh, uh, ACR with iliac fixation, uh, his posture is much better. You may have seen this case in the uh, Nuvasiv's case of the week or the month or whatever. They wouldn't use two cages because that's an off-label use of the, uh, of the implant. But you can see uh, here on the far left, um, the, and it's a CT scan, sagittal MRI, but bottom line is you can see the uh, uh, profound uh, correction just at the one level. Uh, we've done it at transitional levels, and we've even done it at L4-5, and it's a little trickier, and, uh, you know, you have to uh, use a little more fluoro, but you go in and release the in inner space and put the implant in, and you can just see with just only postural reduction, uh, the improvement uh, in the lordosis uh, uh, with the implant. And here's a woman on the left who had a, a grade two spondylolisthesis thesis with stenosis. Maybe that's why she's leaning forward a little bit, but we do the, the uh, TLIF ACR, reduce her completely, posture is much improved. This woman on the right <clears throat> had a, a, an auto fusion at L4-5, um, and we did uh, TLIF ACR on her, instrumented her on one side down to S2, and you can see the improvement in her, her, her posture. And again, all this can be done, and you have to show your one case with the, or your many cases with the tattoo, but all this can be done through small incisions, particularly if it's just at the one level. <clears throat> And just to reiterate about tube size, here you see a 14 millimeter tube sitting over the L45 disc space, pretty much over the target where you wanna be. As you put larger tubes in, you take the center of your working space away from uh, where you need to be. And you're really working in a small crescent off to the right. So sometimes a bigger tube is not better. As you can see here on the left, you're getting that bigger tube, you're getting more and more over the facet and you're increasing the likelihood that you uh, either uh, uh, destabilize the facet or destroy it completely. So just to kind of recap uh, some general guidelines, uh, smaller is sometimes and often is better. You're actually, even though the tube is smaller, you're, you've got a larger working space. For routine disc ruptures and re-ruptures, we use a 14 tube. For uh, uh, spinal stenosis in a male, we'll use an 18. In a female, we use a 16. But as we get up in males and females into the L23 and L34 levels, we use the 16 tube so we, we don't violate the facets. We do the 20 uh, fusions through 20 and 22 millimeter tubes. You can do them through 18, but the angled uh, uh, cup and ring curettes 
uh, are too long to fit down an 18 millimeter tube. And you need, you need that length to get across the disc space and to do a, 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 an adequate uh, discectomy. So just some final thoughts. If, if there is a learning curve clearly to anything, including minimally invasive spinal surgery. And it's not only steep, but it's lengthy. Steep implies that you learn fairly quickly. It's, it's lengthy, but there comes a point, your goal should be that you shouldn't do a minimally invasive case unless you can do it as well or better than you can open. And I will tell you, that's how we feel about our T-lifts. I haven't done an open T-lift in, in 10 or 15 years easily. Um, you won't be compensated. Unfortunately, for the time it takes to learn and for the, the, some of the difficulties that you encounter, uh, you won't be compensated for doing an MIS case. It doesn't pay any more than doing it open, uh, unfortunately. And that's probably one of the reasons why the penetration remains at 25, 30%. So you really, you're doing patients uh, as a matter of personal integrity, as well as uh, for the patient's uh, benefit. So uh, most of you don't know, but uh, my father was a neurosurgeon, was the uh, first professor of neurosurgery at the University of Florida in Gainesville. And so uh, I was uh, essentially in a neurosurgery training program until I was age 32. And uh, I didn't realize that my father had been really training me to, to do neurosurgery. But of course, uh, you know, I always wanted to impress him. And uh, he used to say that uh, the essence of neurosurgery, and he was right, that sometimes this was what makes it different from really the other specialties, that sometimes you must take a more difficult approach to get a better result. And I firmly believe that's the case. And back to the question of perception versus reality, which is really you know, what, what, what groups like Laser Spine and so forth have done to exploit um, the, the, the band-aid, if you will. Well, let's be real. Reality is reality. The facts are the facts. Perception reflects the intellectual honesty and the critical thinking of the one doing the perceiving. When I was young, <clears throat> I would go to my father and say, look, hey, dad, you know, aren't you impressed? I, I got a hundred on my science or math test. And his response wasn't congratulations or keep up the good work. His response was a hundred out of how many? So you have to keep an open mind. You have to be critical, even cynical about what you see and make sure that Oops, my last slide. That when you're the author of this incision, the quality of the work uh, underneath uh, reflects what the patient sees and what everyone else sees. So with that, uh, I wanna thank uh, uh, Q again and everyone. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, I know this was kind of a whirlwind overview, um, uh, but, uh, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Beautiful work, Javier. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful work, Dr. Garcia. We have, you know, uh, probably a few questions here from our spine colleagues. Uh, maybe we can start. I see already Dr. Aboriyama, he raised his hand. Kinsley, go ahead, take it, take it away. Uh, really an excellent talk. And I think you really hit all the highlights of minimally invasive and uh, the good, like you said, and some of the difficulty that comes with it. You know, the question that I had was mainly to do with minimally invasive and uh, deformity correction. Um, you know, first of all, I, I guess my first part, first part of my question is uh, when you guys are doing a minimally invasive approach, are you guys coming uh, to the back and doing an open approach or are you doing percutaneous instrumentation? Yeah, these are hugely challenging cases and uh, we do them all percutaneously. Uh, we, we don't do uh, any open unless that is the best thing for the patient. So the one case I showed you, I, I, I intentionally did that, that, you know, doing a T lift in this particular case, you know, my, my view was let's go ahead and do a, you know, an A lift and, and get that done. But generally speaking, all the osteotomies and the decompressions are all done through a tube. And, uh, and so we've staged these in general uh, as a consequence, because it's just too much work of putting dilators down and doing, you know, going from one level to the next and then going to the other side. Uh, but yeah, we try to do them uh, and, in, you know, but if, if, if the case, if the conditions or the circumstances call for to do something open, we would do it open. So for example, in, in, in deformity cases where I've had to extend somebody and, and add on to rods, uh, uh, sometimes I'll do those just open. We won't do those minimally invasively, even though the, the first, the index procedure was. Great, great, great response. And then my, I guess my other question is, uh, you know, I guess some people kind of look at deformity as not only an issue within the the uh, the, the disc and, and uh, the deformity itself, but to get a good correction, you really need to release those muscles. 
get a good fusion um, and you know really anchor into the what is S two ALRs or or iliac uh, to get a good bottom fixation. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And no especially question. minimally invasive. Yeah, no question about it. And 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 I I think you're you're referring to a subtle point here that I think needs to be said, which is that. Uh, there is a, at this juncture a very limited role uh, and, and certain select cases for, to do these uh, uh, deformities minimally invasively. And uh, you know, I will tell you that uh, uh, you know, I, we're, we're not doing every deformity uh, uh, minimally invasively, that's for sure. Um, uh, so uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not that, I don't want to imply that these cases should be done MIS. There are cases that can be done MIS but uh, they're probably the easier cases, uh, uh, quite frankly, and they're not the ones obviously going to uh, T2. So you're really talking um, about uh, I, lumbar issues. I'm gonna pivot right now to Dr. Nami from uh, Colombia who has a question, and then I'm gonna go to Chris, who I saw he lifted his uh, hand as well. Jose, go ahead and ask your question, please. Thank you, Dr. Garcia, for the excellent presentation. Uh, my question is, do you have experience performing uh, spinal tumor surgeries using the tubular retractors? Yeah, we've done a few cases, again, you know, very uh, selective with those for a variety of reasons, not least of which in an intradural, in the situation of intradural tumors is, is dural repair. And uh, uh, so uh, we've done a few, uh, you know, certainly we've done extradural tumors, schwannomas, uh, uh, things like that. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, very limited, the number of, and I think I've probably done maybe four or five intradural tumors. They're very difficult to do uh, with the tube. Again, mostly because of the issue of dural repair. Is it worth doing an MIS case to then end up with the spinal fluid leak and the drain and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera the morbidity associated with that? Beautiful. I, I see uh, Chris actually had to jump to another meeting. He was just saying, thank you, wonderful talk. But I'm going to pivot right now to Dr. Chen. Go ahead, Selby. Hi, Dr. Garcia. It's an absolutely fantastic talk. I actually wish I'd heard that talk when I was first venturing into uh, MIS spine surgery. Um, so I just have, I guess, one comment and one question. Uh, first comment is, you know, you ended the talk by talking about, a, um, you know, decreasing the size or the diameter of your tubular retractors. And I, I actually agree, you know, my standard has been a 20 millimeter tubular retractor for even just my MIS microdisc. But I often found that if the facet is hypertrophied, um, then you actually can't get that tube down to where you want to operate. And there's a lot of muscle creep and you actually end up having to resect, uh, you know, some muscle. So um, I'm definitely going to start using some smaller retractors, um, you know, for my micro discs. And in terms of, um, you know, you, you talked about using some fat to protect uh, the protect Kamen's triangle and then reconstituting the facets. I've actually never heard of that technique, uh, um, which I think would be great, if, especially if you have to do a bilateral facetectomy for restoring some lordosis. Um, could you actually talk a little bit more about that um, so that you then are able to actually get bilateral facet fusion as well uh, through an MIS approach? Yeah, so, um... Uh, you know, you're, you're going to get a good fusion bed from the resection of the spear articular process of the inferior vertebra. Where things aren't so good is in the, is removing the the, uh, the inferior articular process of the superior vertebra, and you have to drill out into the lamina a little bit. But but typically by preserving, by only drilling out the cartilaginous surface of that inferior articular process of the superior vertebra, you get a fairly good uh, fusion bed for that. We get the fat um, uh, typically. So if we've done an X lift, we'll take the fat that, from that incision as we're as we're coming out. Um, if we do a T lift, we will do it uh, before we put the dilators down, or we will make an incision. We will extend the incision where one of our robotic pins went, and, uh, and that way we can bill for getting the fat graft. Uh, but the purpose of that really is twofold. Number one, I, it has, it has uh, in my experience, reduced the uh, degree of radiculitis that patients get from leaving the nerve kind of exposed, number one. Number two, um, uh, you know, the, 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 it decreases the scar tissue uh, to some extent because you don't have this big void that's just gonna fill with blood. Um, it, if you ever had to re-explore, it's a little easier to, to uh, uh, re-explore. And then finally, it basically serves as a, as a hemostatic agent, the piece of fat in the foramen there. And uh, so we never put a drain and we don't, have, we don't worry about epidural hematoma. Um, 
The, uh, we use the bone filings from the drill uh, when we don't take autograph. And we're taking autograph less and less. It's just a lot of work. And like I said, uh, it takes a lot of time. And, and, uh, uh, but, but we'll use the bone filings from the drill and uh, use that to reconstitute the facet joint. Um, and in this way, we're not drilling out. You know, so if you were to do an inner body fusion and expose the intertransverse space and do an intertransverse fusion, you will see at six months that all that bone in the intertransverse uh, area is gone and that the fusion will only be in the, in the facet column. And the reason being is because um, the, 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 uh, the lack of an, an inner body fusion and traditional intertransverse fusion, uh, the lack of an inner body device, that's the dynamic component that, that creates all this robust bone growth uh, posterolaterally. But with an inner body implant, the stiffness of the construct, construct doesn't allow for that. So the bone doesn't grow between the transverse processes. It grows more centrally in, in, the, uh, in the axis of vertically of the spine, which in this case is the facet column. I don't know if I answered your question. But. No, you did actually, it was great. And, and, and I, I totally agree. I don't even try in my MIS cases uh, for an inner transverse uh, fusion anymore. I rely strictly on uh, really the inner body a fusion mostly. And then if I'm able to get a facet fusion, typically on the other side, I will do that. But now, you know, hearing you talk about that, um, you know, putting, laying down some fat in the frame and, and then some bone graft on top of that, I actually think that's a great technique. I'll probably start adopting that. And Shall me, so let me add that it's interesting. There are a number of cases where the inner body fusion doesn't look so good at six months or a year, and you do a CT scan and the posterior lateral fusion looks very good. And so, uh, you know, that, that has told me, well, I don't need to, you know, the pain is not probably coming from the, uh, you know, what looks like a non-union in the inner body space. So it's, it's another kind of a sentinel uh, to see if you're, you're achieving fusion uh, as you monitor the patient post-op. Yeah, no, absolutely, guys. that's great. Thank you, Selva. I'm gonna make a comment about that and then I'm gonna to go to Eric and then back to Kingsley. But I wanna make the comment, it turns out that 110 years ago, Harvey Cushion was using fat for these type of situations. It took a number of years to realize that even in pure fat, there's about a 1% of stem cells. We now know, based on the clinical trials that we're launching here and, and 20 years of NIH funding, that we can actually harvest and use that to heal. You know, right now we have Antonio and Rachel are doing a clinical trial for recovery of bone and the scalp, when we put the bones back and someone may be infected, we're using the stem cells that's based on a clinical trial, first on the skin, now on the bone, and now we're using them in the brain. So I congratulate Javier, this is a very, it turns out that this has been done for many, many years, but we didn't know exactly the, the, the reason why it works. But yes, there's a lot of factors that are being secreted by fat. So I really encourage, you know, using this more and more. And potentially, I encourage you, Javier, to look at your results, publish them because I bet you there's a lot of power there in all the cases that you've done. I love that fact that you put right there. I'm glad that Selby picked up on that. I'm gonna to go to Eric and then back to Kinsley. Go ahead, Eric. Hey, Javier, great talk. Uh, quick question, you know, I've revised a lot of minimally invasive uh, procedures from around town, none of yours, of course, but no, I'm what sure would you say- I'm sure kind to say that. <laughs> what would you say uh, would be a, a not an optimal case for minimally invasive? You know, what I've seen is, sequestered disc fragments into the axilla, calcified discs, a grade two or three L5S1 spondy, uh, revised uh, some of those. And so in your opinion, is there a case that you shouldn't do no invasive on? So that's a difficult question to answer, uh, uh, quite frankly. I, I, let me just say about the, about the, um, the failure of MIS uh, cases. Um, the fact of the matter, Eric, is, is that too many people do a bad MIS, and I've done them too, but most of what I see around town is pure garbage. And, and it's not just around town, but around the country. And some of what I do is pure garbage. And that's the problem. It's an integrity issue, Eric. I think you can do most cases uh, 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 MIS, but, but, but at the end of the day, it doesn't change the surgical principles. I mean, MIS is about access. That's entirely what it is. But once you're there, the, the, the surgery doesn't change, right? You still have to address the pathology. And, and what I see is uh, that people taking the easy way out, they, they, they put a tube down or a split tube or whatever it may do. They do a poor job with decompression or dispreparation. Um, they, they, don't, they don't apply the fundamentals of spine surgery 
uh, disc prep, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 preparing the, the, the bone grafting uh, sites. And, and that's really where the failures come. And then I think there's a, a combination too, is the lack of understanding of the biomechanics of how the spine works. So I, I don't know. I mean, it, again, it's an integrity issue about uh, doing something correctly. And, uh, you know, so many of these MIS cases are just not done well. And that's how they end up in your office. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, what about a redo microscopy? Would you go uh, MIS on redos or not? Yes, I would. Yeah. And again, once you're there, you're applying the same principles as you would if you filleted the patient open. It's, it's the same surgery. Now, you're, you're, you're in a tighter space in certain circumstances, and, and you're going to have to use your technology a little differently. But uh, no, I've, I've, uh, I've always uh, done these cases, uh, uh, MIS, uh, even uh, you know, the, the second and third recurrence. Uh, of course, when you get into that, you're talking now about a fusion. But, uh, but uh, uh, you know, I, I just feel comfortable doing that. Again, once I'm down there, it, it's the, the principles are the same. You have to find normal dura. And uh, you, you know you gotta you gotta create your planes and so forth. It doesn't change just because it's MIS. Beautiful, thank you, Eric. And uh, one more question from Dr. Bodhi Gam, and then I want you to spend a few minutes with the fellows and the residents to give them some advice. Go ahead, Ty Kinsley. I think you're muted, Kinsley. Sorry, uh, I was saying I have two questions, real two real quick ones, if you don't mind. Uh, one of them is kind of relating back to the question Dr. Nupai just asked was uh, your thoughts on minimally invasive approach for redos fusion um, done, uh, done MIS, obviously. Yeah, so again, that's, a, that's a, a very individualized depending on the circumstances. Um, uh, the decision to do it minimally invasively would depend on, on what was done originally and where the problem is. So, um, you know, uh, if the best thing is to do an A lift, for example, that that's what I would do. And the, the challenges that are the, the, the issues that determine that will be what failed. So if you've got an implant that is in the middle of the disc that has subsided, uh, that's probably going to be difficult to remove posteriorly. Uh, the other problem is, is if you try to do it posteriorly, you might damage enough implant that you're not going to be able to get satisfactorily a new implant back in and get good end plate coverage and, and uh, interbody stability. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm cautious uh, doing uh, uh, revision uh, surgery MIS. And typically if I were to see a fairly well-preserved disc space with an interbody implant that looks like it has a non-union, my revision strategy would be to go in posterolaterally and do a posterolateral fusion and put new hardware in. If there was a clearly a, you know, subsidence and a, a problem in the disc space, I would probably, I, my first thought would be to approach it going laterally. Um, in the case I showed you in the talk with the extruded uh, banana implant, I actually went in posteriorly first, took the implant out. And I went in posteriorly first because it was essentially in Cambin's triangle. And I felt that that was very safe to go after it. Then I turned the patient on their side and did an X-lift so that I could, I could uh, capture the apophyseal ring and rebuild that inner space uh, uh, back up. So, I mean, it's a very good question. Again, it, 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 you know, don't, don't do something MIS just to say you're doing an MIS. You, you know, you, you're just putting that patient, that's a speed bump to a, to a morphine pump, so. Beautiful, one more question. I'm so sorry, but this is Gabriel Vargas from Colombia. Uh, Gabriel, go ahead and ask your question, and then we're going to wrap it up. <laughs> Tons of questions, Gabriel. As you can see, go ahead. Sorry, Gabriel. sorry for the time. Sorry no for problem. The, no problem. It's good. Um, what What is your thinking about this regeneration with uh, substance less the people use on knees or things like that, platelet components, or even fat, as Dr. Quinones mentioned right now, the stem cells for this regeneration don't use fusion. Just put something in there, and then the disc goes back, and uh, you know, when they hide and things like that. What is your opinion about that? Well, if you've got something you're not telling us about, give me a call after this conference. I'd like to hear more about it. But that that clearly is the holy grail, right? And uh, you know, the, the the question that I would throw back at you is, uh, what's the shape of the disc to begin with? If the disc has right. collapsed, 
you're not going to regenerating it is probably folly, right? And, uh, and so this gets into the age old dilemma. How many spinal operations work best if you do them when the anatomy looks more normal, which is you know, counterintuitive, right? It goes against our thinking where spine surgery should be a treatment of last resort, et cetera, et cetera. And so you know, this is a decision to regenerate a disc probably in the earlier stages than in the later stages of disc degeneration, right? And, and of course, intuitively, you would be more reluctant to, to apply that kind of treatment. But that's, that's the holy grail, right? Is to, is to stop the aging. Uh, and not just I, in discs. <laughs> I think the future, Gabriel, is going to be stem cells with some uh, implants. You, you need to st still have some sort of uh, um, implant that would allow stem cells to regenerate. And it's going to depend, as Javier said, the quality of the disc. This is why we're collecting the disc, actually, in our in one of our NA studies that Kinsley is leading with Mo Biden and Gaetano as well in creating a biobank. Because we need to understand what is that disc, what is the quality, can we then use something to regenerate that? And I think that's the holy yeah. group. But I don't think that we're too far from that, to be honest with you. I think in the next decade, we're going to see a future in yes. which we're going to have better implants, better quality, and would allow things to uh, fuse better. And I think, but we're still going to have to do minimally invasive. That's why we need the surgical techniques to be able to get them there safe with Absolutely. better you know, devices and stuff. So listen, Javier, tons of questions. I wanted you, you can see uh, Andres put in the schedule a few minutes with the fellows and the residents to ask where the morning goes really fast. And then you're going to meet with Dr. Chen and Dr. Nant Meyer from 8.30 to 9. And then I come back to you at 9 a.m. to meet for 30 minutes. It's a short morning full of speed. You saw it, it as what we do every Monday, you know? And when we had visitors in person every Sunday, I was in dinners with all of you guys. It was a well, I was looking for this break. So the pandemic was actually good from my perspective from that way. But we're looking forward to uh, having you visit on campus. And so we're going to let you go. There's another link right there to connect for a few minutes. And then you're going to see us going in and out. Sounds All great. All right. Thank you, Q. And thank you, everybody. I appreciate your attention. Beautiful talk. Have a great week, everybody. All right. Thank Bye -bye. you. <laughs>